Welcome everybody to um, this PBL academic lecture. For me, it's the second as a new director of the PBL. I don't know how long you're allowed to say that you're the new director of the PBL. So let's, let's make this the last time, uh, at least in the context of the PBL academic lecture. Welcome to you all. Uh, uh, I, think, I think everybody's rather familiar, well, the most of you are rather familiar with the tradition of the PBL academic lecture. Uh, uh, we organize them two or three, four times a year. Uh, uh, in principle, uh, uh, they're aimed at the PBL uh, organization itself, but also we ins also invite people from outside to join us in uh, what we always aim for, that's uh, intellectually stimulating debates, which will bring our knowledge a step further. So welcome to you all. Um, this afternoon, we are going to listen to and talk about uh, the smart city, uh, big data, datafication of the city, and what that is doing to the city itself and our uh, uh, planning of the city. And, you know, it, so diving into that theme, uh, everybody will be confronted with a sort of split-level reality. Uh, on the one hand, there is great optimism. You know, datafication will deliver, our, deliver, deliver us smart mobility systems. We no longer have to wait for empty buses, but you know, buses will adjust themselves to our behavior instead of the other way around. We, we, get, we get smart lightning systems in cities, uh, also traffic light systems. So no longer waiting at night for red lights, uh, waiting for the traffic which, which isn't there. So again, the systems will be adjusting themselves to us. Uh, we, have, we have a greening of the city because we can design smart energy systems which are much more efficient. So, so there, is, there is a discourse there of hope, of utopia, of, of data delivering us better working cities. And on the other hand, there are sort of negative scenarios which talk about an increase of control, uh, uh, which talk about privacy, the loss of privacy. We leave a trail of data behind us, even as we sit now in this room, we are, in a certain sense, communicating a lot of that. Yes, your mobile phones can be turned off, <laughs> or at least the noise should be turned down. But we leave a trace of data, which, of course, others then can use to, to, to sort of make an estimate of where we are, et cetera, et cetera. So there are privacy issues, there are control issues. There's also the issue of, of, of who's owning these data, the privatization of these data, and, and the owners of the data can also make use of the knowledge behind the data. So in a certain sense, it's also about the commodification of the lived environment, of the private sphere. Because making use of these commercialized data, commercial firms can then, in a certain sense, also commodify parts of our informal life. Which is happening, of course. Airbnb is not just about, you know, it's about informal spaces, then all of a sudden being out there in the market. So, so you know, there are different possibilities there. And, and of course, then the challenge is, because there's always an in-between, of course, because it's not neither the one nor the other extreme, it's always in between, but then you know, the challenge is to really become, come a step further and really identify what the interesting space in between is. So where are our possibilities? And this afternoon, the discussion of this afternoon, I hope will bring us further. The discussion of this afternoon will really be about, okay, so do we get, how do we get beyond the all too extreme positive and negative scenarios to a, a vision of how can we make use of the datafication of the city to improve our cities, to make them much more inclusive, to make them much more collectively owned, the knowledge democracy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The speakers uh, are not to be blamed for a possibly failure of this afternoon because they're excellent. Uh, uh, welcome to Professor Kitchen. Rob Kitchen, uh, we already had a workshop with you, a very interesting workshop. Uh, uh, I don't think I'll really have to introduce you to you a lot because a lot of your publication will be well known. But let me just, mm -hmm. for the people who don't know, uh, mention a few of your titles and, and, and uh, your publications. So Rob Kitchen is Professor of Human Geography and Director of the National Institute of Regional and Spatial Analysis at the National University of Maynooth. Is, is that the correct pronunciation? The University of Ireland. Sorry? The National University of Ireland, okay. Maynooth. Okay. 
good. That, that's my Irish, sorry. <laughs> Um, um, and you're a lead researcher at the Programmable City, Programmable City Project, mm -hmm. uh, the Iris Digital Repository, the All Island Research Observatory, and the Dublin Dashboard. So, so you know, quite a few projects there. And the last two books which are out there, in a series of books, is The Data Revolution by Sage, uh, Big Data, Open Data, Data Infrastructures and Their Consequences, and by MIT Press, Code Space, Software in Everyday Life. Uh, Professor Kitchen is first of all giving his lecture, and then straight after the lecture, we have uh, Albert Meyer from the University of Utrecht, uh, Professor of Public Management. Uh, you gave your inaugural speech just in July, uh, and the speech is out there, so for those of you who still want to read it, uh, ask uh, Professor Meyer for a copy of his inaugural speech, which was about governance in the data polis, smart city, happy citizens, question mark. So first, the speakers will do uh, their bit, and then it's open for discussion. And let's make sure that at the end of the afternoon, we go, we leave this room again, enriched so that we know that there is something in between the positive and the negative scenarios. Professor Kitchen, may I invite you to the floor to give yep. your lecture? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, very much for the invitation uh, to, uh, to talk um, about uh, smart cities. I'm going to start effectively from the principle that some people don't really know much about smart cities and then work my way up. So forgive this if it's a bit uh, introductory at the, at the, at the start. Um, so there's, can we turn down the microphone a little bit? Just, so lots of, there's lots of definitions of smart cities in the, in, the, in the literature. They generally encompass three different dynamics. The first one is really around instrumentation and regulation, which is cities composed of what we might call everywhere. So this is computation embedded into the fabric of cities. So this is uh, various kinds of digital devices, ICT sensors, software, big data, and so on. And the idea is, is that cities become uh, knowable and controllable in uh, new dynamic reactive ways. And then this kind of leads to more efficient, uh, competitive, productive uh, service de uh, delivery. The second is really around uh, kind of policy and economic development, and it's basically advances in ICT, kind of reconfigure human capital, creativity, innovation, education, sustainability, uh, governance, and so on, uh, whether that also might be things around sharing economy, et cetera. You know, this is cities as competitive, as entrepreneurial, as knowledge-driven uh, systems. And the third one is around kind of social innovation, uh, civic engagement, hacktivism, and so on. So ICT being used for more kind of transparent, accountable governance, new forms of civic participation, better informed citizens, and so on. And really, most cities are actually blending all three, and they do them in different uh, degrees. So one city might have its emphasis on instrumentation and regulation, less so on policy development, less so on so social innovation, or they might place it in different, uh, different emphases. And of course, different cities in different contexts will have different uh, kind of priorities. So some cities, it might be about security and safety. Some it might be more about economy. Some it might be all more about efficiency and transparency and accountability. Uh, and so on. So basically there isn't one kind of generic smart city. There are kind of varieties of smart cities and they kind of blended with these kind of different um, uh, uh, kind of elements, if you like. And they kind of consist of a vari various kinds of different technologies across uh, a number of different domains. So within government, it might be uh, city operating systems, performance management systems, urban dashboards and so on security emergency management, it might be control rooms, digital surveillance, predictive policing, coordinated emergency response. In transport, things like intelligent transport systems, integrated ticketing, smart parking, transport apps, logistics uh, management, energy, it's smart grids, it's smart meters, it's energy usage apps, it's smart lighting. Waste, it's things like compactor bins with dynamic routing and collection. Uh, environment, it might be sensor networks looking at things like pollution, noise, weather, and so on, and down to buildings, homes, and uh, civics, various kinds of apps, open data, volunteered uh, data, and hacks, and so on. And all of those really are generating various forms of uh, urban big data, or big data in general, uh, around, the, around the city, and that data is being then used by uh, various kinds of algorithms to process that and to, um, 
and to and to run and control different uh, systems. So I, I've just kind of packaged up the big urban data into three uh, groups, if you like. The first is directed, which is this is the uh, person is still kind of in or on the loop and is directing the camera and is involved in the process of the of the data generation. Uh, so uh, surveillance, CCTV, drone, satellite, scale public administration records, things like um, automated forms of surveillance, um, uh, so kind of automated automatic number plate recognition cameras, for example, various kinds of digital devices, so like the spy in your pocket, your smartphone, and as you've already pointed out, lots of data is streaming off your phone uh, right now, even though you're, you're not using it. Uh, all kinds of sensors, actuators, transponders, meters in the environment, uh, generating data on a real-time basis, uh, sending that data back, all kinds of interactions and transactions going across uh, various forms of intranets and internets, and then data that we volunteer ourselves, so we give up through social media, through Twitter and uh, Flickr and so on, or wearables like Fitbit or Nike fuel bands and so on, through to crowdsourcing and neo-geography, so uh, people working on things like OpenStreetMap or Wikipedia, uh, and citizen science, so people actually uh, contributing to science projects, so people might have a weather station in their back garden that's plugged uh, onto the internet and is up uploading the data onto Wonderground, which is then going off into uh, weather forecasts uh, and so on. So lots of kind of um, uh, data kind of streaming around. Uh, it's, it's big data in the sense that it's real time and it's exhaustive, so it's exhausted to a system. So uh, automatic number plate recognition cameras are scanning every single car uh, a bin uh, tracking MAC addresses as, as you walk past as a, on the sensor is, is collecting the MAC address of every phone that goes past. Um, the camera is catching every person walking past. Uh, Twitter is capturing every person on Twitter. Obviously not the people who are on, off Twitter, but it's N equals all within Twitter. That's the sample of the data. So this is not sample data. It's kind of N equals all uh, data. How we make sense of it, though, is often to get it into small data or sampled data. And we have a whole range of uh, diverse uh, public-private generation now of fine scale, so uniquely indexical. By uniquely indexical, I mean each one has a unique ID. So my phone has a unique ID, my car has a unique ID. These various objects, these various transactions, these various territories, uh, these various people all have the ability to uniquely identify and track uh, those uh, individuals or objects and so on. And there's lots of different... Uh, uh, groups now, who stakeholders who, who are generating this data, whether that's utilities, so gas, electricity, water, and so on, whether it's transport providers or logistic systems, who are tapping in and tapping out, or say the London Underground, uh, various environmental agencies with pollution sensors, mobile phone operators who are tracking your phone off the mast or off the GPS. Um, uh, app developers are also tracking the phone off of, off of the, um, uh, off of the uh, GPS and so on. Uh, social media sites, uh, travel and accommodation sites, so things like TripAdvisor where you might be uploading uh, reviews and so on, home appliances like a Nest thermostat, um, entertainment systems, financial institutions, retail chains, tracking all the credit card transactions and purchases and so on, using beacons to track people as they walk around the store and where they are in the store, etc. Uh, private, private surveillance security firms, remote sensing, emergency services, and so on. So basically, there's a lot and lot of data now being generated uh, about us and about our activities, and it's producing a data deluge that can be combined, analyzed, and acted upon. And this is part of the kind of the challenge within smart cities is, is to turn this data into actionable data that will enable us to run the city in a more kind of efficient, effective uh, way. The other kind of trend that's happening is we're moving from single systems. So we could take a system like transport, where we might be collecting data from transduction loops, from cameras, from sensors, and so on, with uh, cameras, and we're feeding it back into control rooms. The car itself might be communicating with the environment around it through uh, telematic networks, uh, and so on. Um, uh, so like the buses in Dublin, for example, have transponders on the front of the buses, and that information feeds back into the intelligent transport system as a way of working out queue uh, length times at uh, junctions. Then your average car, of course, has about 40 to 50 computers uh, on it. So you're effectively driving a computer on wheels these days, which is why when you take it in for a service, they plug a laptop in and have a look at the diagnostics to see what's been uh, going on. But we're moving from single systems into integrated systems. So we're starting to take data within domains, like transport or utilities, energy, and so on, and uh, pull that data uh, together. 
So these are four schematics for city operating systems. So in the top left, you've got IBM's uh, television operations center. The bottom left, you've got Microsoft City Next. In the top right, you've got Obotica's um, city operating system. And in the bottom right, you've got Living Planet's urban operating system. And the idea here is, is that you can control various elements of the, of the system or look at various elements of the system through a single uh, kind of portal. In the same way that I could use Windows on this computer to look at Excel and Word and PowerPoint and so on, and I can access different parts and do. This is the same kind of thing for, 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 uh, uh, for a city. Um, so we're trying to break down the silos and link, uh, link these various systems together so we get kind of systems to systems uh, idea. And the data is feeding back into these kind of rooms. So these are urban uh, control rooms in, in different cities. So the top left is uh, the Rio Center, which is probably the most uh, talked about one. It's, uh, it's, it runs 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. It employs 400 people. Uh, in there looking at the various data and so on. It's pulling together data from real-time data from 30 different city agencies. So whether that's the transport data or the weather data or whether it's environmental data around landslides or uh, flood levels or um, emergency service data, so police and uh, ambulance and so on. It's, uh, um, it's pulling social media data, so they're looking at Twitter feeds and, and, uh, uh, and so on. Um, uh, camera feeds, so all that kind of data is pulling back in there and they're trying to use it to manage on a, on a kind of real-time basis, operational basis, what's happening in the city. So it was, it was partly built because they had some very large events about to happen there. So uh, the, obviously the Olympics this year, the World Cup, the Confederations Cup, and so on. So it was a way of partly addressing some of the management governance issues of the city. The bottom left one, I think, is Sydney. Uh, the top right one, I think, is Kawasaki. And you can see some of the analytics on here are quite... Uh, details in terms of monitoring what's happening within that. I think that's within a district. And the bottom right one is actually a control room for a single road. Uh, this is the control room for the M25 motorway around London. This is what it takes to keep the traffic flowing on that road in some kind of order, and it not to be gridlocked permanently. And then some of that data feeds out into the public and through things like the uh, dashboard. So these are uh, some example uh, dashboards. The top the one on the left here is the one that my team has built for the city of Dublin. And there's a whole series of modules in there. I think there's 56 different modules in there. So if you go into each one of these modules, you go down, there's different uh, layers. Uh, so there's a kind of a snapshot of how the city's doing. And then there's a how's Dublin doing, which is indicator data. Um, so it tells you how the city's been performing on health and education and transport and housing and planning and so on. So it gives you kind of long-term time series uh, data. It also allows you to compare Dublin with other cities in Europe, Dublin with other regions in Ireland. It tells you how the money has been spent by the local authority uh, and so on. The Dublin Real Time has, uh, the real, uh, obviously has the real time data for the city in environment and transport. So it has the weather data, the water meter data, the sound sensor data, has the weather data, has the pollution data. Uh, on the environment side, on the, um, on the transport side, it would have the road speeds of the road segment, so how long it would take you to get along a road segment. It has the CCTV footage, so you can click on a camera to see the CCTV footage at any one time. How many, how many bikes are in the bike stands? How many spaces are in the bike stands? Um, how many spaces are in the car parks? Um, what else is in there? Where the buses are, where the trains are, um, where, the, where the boats are in the harbour and what the boats are and what they're carrying and so on. So there's quite a lot of information, and that's, that's uh, open data, so other people can then take that data and build their, build their own apps off the, off the back of that data, so there's open APIs uh, on it. There's a whole series of mapping modules, looking at census data, crime data, how, um, um, employment data and so on, planning data around uh, land use planning, also around planning permissions, uh, the Dublin near to me is information about where all the bottle banks are, where all the post offices are, where all the pharmacies are, uh, their opening hours, how you get to them, how long it will take you to get there, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, some information on housing, um, a, a whole series of modules about housing and land availability. The Dublin reporting is you, you can say to the system, um, there's graffiti or there's a pothole or there's a light out or there's something in my area and this is where it is and it links directly into their customer relation management system and goes directly into their workflow. So by reporting through it, you're, you basically 
help to contribute to how, how city workers go and fix problems. And then the data store is obviously all the data that's off the back of that and the apps, the various apps that people have built using some of, this, some of this data. So the idea is to push the data out and let citizens and companies and other people be able to uh, utilize the data, but also build other modules. So a number of the modules in there we've not built. If somebody's done it and they've done a really good job, we just take it and import it. Well, we, we effectively create a port and we link out to them. Uh, we're not going to replicate. The London one here is just a, a, a city at a glance. So it's not an analytical one. There's no levels. This is, this is the entire dashboard. And it just gives you, at a glance, what's going on in London. And then this was a kind of a mock-up for, uh, for Chicago. Is, uh, I think it's a few, years, a few years old now. But the idea is that you can push the data out, and citizens can also uh, use uh, some of this uh, data. So basically, the argument is, is that these cities are becoming uh, ever more instrumented and networked, and their systems are becoming inter interlinked and integrated. And that this is creating kind of new, uh, uh, kind of more knowledgeable, more knowable and more con uh, controllable in new dynamic ways. So urban operational governance and city services are becoming uh, highly responsive to a form of networked urbanism in which big data uh, are kind of prefiguring and setting the urban agenda. They're producing a deluge of uh, contextual and actionable uh, data. They're influencing and controlling how city systems respond and perform in real time. And they're transforming uh, the practices of city governance because they're, they're changing the operational nature of city governance. But they also do change the, govern uh, the, uh, the kind of wider governance in that, in that people st uh, uh, there's an idea about which you can use these as data levers to kind of steer and control the city and to kind of monitor, so performance metrics for monitoring what's going on and then to kind of uh, set programs of work and to discipline workers and so on. So this is the kind of the promise of smart cities then, which I've already kind of gone through, and this is the kind of the typical uh, six-fold classification. There's an idea in which this kind of smart city enables a smart economy around entrepreneurship, innovation, productivity, competitiveness, creates a smart environment in terms of green energy, sustainability, resilience, enables smart mobility through intelligent transport systems, multimodal interoperability, efficiency gains, and so on. Enable smart governance through uh, uh, e-government, open data, transparency, accountability, evidence-informed decision-making, better service delivery. Creates uh, smarter living through uh, improving quality of life, improving safety, reducing uh, risk, managing risk, uh, uh, enhancing security. And it creates smarter uh, people through more informed, uh, through making them more informed, and uh, enabling creativity, inclusivity, empowerment, and uh, participation. Okay, so that's, um, so if that's actually the, the promise of smart cities, and at one level it sounds great. So I'm now going to flip round, and I'm now going to do the perils of the smart city and tell you why all of that's really dangerous. Okay. Okay, so, so these are my eight critiques of the smart city. So the first is, is it sets up this notion that the city is this knowable, rational, steerable machine that we can pull on these data levers and move the city around in response to this uh, data. So you know, it, it sets up this notion that these are kind of knowable and manageable systems that act in largely rational, mechanical, linear, hierarchical ways that can be steered and controlled. Um, so that operational governance can be performed using a set of these data levers underpinned by a form of instrumental rationality in the form of key performance indicators and citywide uh, kind of analytics. And obviously that includes various forms of automated management, so uh, kind of aut automatic, autonomous, uh, automated forms of, uh, of managing uh, uh, the city, which is driving new forms of managerial managerialism uh, and so on. But of course, we all know that cities are actually really complex. They're open systems, they're complex, they're full of wicked problems, they're full of competing interests, multiple stakeholders. They, have, they, have, uh, they all have different complex histories, different cultures, different politics, different ambitions, and so on. These are really complex entities, and they're not easily managed. And if you go and fix, try to fix something over here, you often create another wicked problem over there. Okay? So, so they kind of set up a way of thinking about the city that doesn't really match how cities actually work and function. Okay, they, they oversimplify what's uh, uh, going on. The second is, is they kind of posit this notion 
that there can be these kind of objective, neutral, non-ideological approaches to how we think about the city. This is kind of, we just apply this technology, which is kind of applying this science and so on. Um, and it kind of presents this image of being politically not benign and commonsensical as to how this kind of works, as opposed to these technologies actually being full of politics and full of uh, values and decisions and opinions uh, and so on. So, and of course, so these systems actually don't exist independently of ideas, of techniques, of technologies, of people, of contexts that conceive, produce, manage, process, analyze, and store them. They're actually entirely politically value-laden uh, and ideological uh, systems. They express certain worldviews about how things uh, should work and so on. So they're, they're situated, they're contingent, they're relational, they're framed and used contextually to try and achieve certain aims and certain goals. Um, and obviously somebody is choosing what those aims and goals are. Um, and they also contain an, a number of other uh, technical and managerial issues around uh, the data uh, concerning uh, design, measurement, processing. So with respect to the data, we all know that a lot of the data is dirty. Uh, some of it's game, some of it's faked, uh, uh, some of it has issues of quality. Um, there's all kinds of issues around veracity, accuracy, fidelity, uncertainty, error, bias, calibration, reliability, lineage, provenance, uh, and so on. If I was to go back to the Dublin dashboard, I can't tell you any of this. I can't tell you anything about its veracity, its uncertainty, its error, its bias, its calibration. You just have to trust that the data is right, okay, because I don't, I don't have that metadata. It's not outputted, so I, I, I can't share that with you. So, the, the, so, but there are those kinds of issues embedded within this. So not only is the data uh, not kind of neutral and objective, it also has other kinds of issues in it that we often ignore or gloss over. And we gloss over it by saying, uh, more trumps better. This is kind of the phrase that the big data people will use, more trumps better, as if garbage in, garbage out doesn't still hold just because you have a lot of data. The third is it kind of promotes a notion of technocratic governance and solutionism. So this is the notion that we can treat all problems in the city as technical problems that can be fixed with technical solutions. Uh, so this is the notion of solutionism. This, this idea that we can take these complex open systems, we can disassemble them into neatly defined problems that can be fixed or optimized through computation. Uh, all that's really required is sufficient data and suitable algorithms. Um, and of course, what this does, I mean, it does two things really. The first is uh, it undermines or replaces other forms of knowledge and other forms of expertise, uh, other ways of knowing the city and so on. So things like forensis, which is knowledge derived from practice and deliberation, or metas, which is knowledge based on experience. And that's often the knowledge that people who work in cities have over 20 or 30 years of working there and interacting with different constituencies and different uh, problems and different policy issues and so on. And we're kind of saying these technical data systems trump that and they tell us how to fix the city. And of course it also marginalizes other forms of governance and other forms of solutions. So it marginalizes um, uh, maybe more kind of policy interventions or more uh, social interventions or political interventions or more uh, kind of other kinds of investments and so on. So it's my, my, uh, the, um, my example of this is in, say, is in relation to homelessness you're not going to fix homelessness with an app. You might, you might be able to manage homelessness more effectively, but you're not going to fix it. Homelessness is a, deep, uh, is a problem of deep structural inequality, and the only way to fix it is probably redistribution of wealth and better mental health services, plus a few other things. But the, but the app's not going to fix it. It'll just help you manage it more effectively. And it's the same kind of thing we were talking this morning about infrastructure. It's the same kind of... Uh, issue. So I could use Waze, Waze data, to route you more efficiently through, through infrastructure that's uh, not fit for purpose. Okay, so what we're doing is taking a sticking plaster of routing you around the system instead of actually fixing the infrastructure or investing in the infrastructure. The real solution is proper investment in public transport and uh, upgrading of existing infrastructure not finding uh, a, a way of uh, creating rat runs and uh, uh, rerouting people around the city. The fourth is it promotes a kind of a neoliberal political economy and a corporatization of governance. So um, there's been an argument that this is over, uh, the smart city has been overly driven by corporates, corporations interested in capturing government functions as new market 
uh, opportunities. And you see all these kinds of diagrams around saying how much the market is worth. So smart cities is going to be worth you know, $6.7 trillion in the US. And it's going to, you know, oh, sorry, that's Western Europe and 6.8 in North America and so on. And obviously what this is doing is it creates a particular notion of a political economy as to how we think cities should be uh, managed and run and governed and so on. So it's promoting the marketization of public services and the hollowing out of the state. And that obviously uh, creates uh, uh, certain conditions. And it means that city functions are being administered for profit uh, in many uh, cases. And there's real questions as to whether we think that that's a good idea uh, or not. And I'm sure everybody in the room has different opinions on that. But it also potentially creates technological lock-ins and corporate path dependencies. What does it mean to give the control room to a city, to a private entity to run on your behalf using their proprietary software, and then you're locked into that software and you can't really move out very easily if you haven't written stuff into your procurement contracts. Okay, so, and then you're on that path dependency, you're reliant on that company for a long time. It's very difficult to uh, swap over to an, an entirely different uh, system. Uh, particularly when all your data ends up being in proprietary formats and stuff as well. So there's, there's some questions there. Um, it tends to be, the discourse around the smart city, it tends to be quite a historical, aspatial, homogenizing and bounded. And by that I mean often this, the technology is pitched as a one-size-fits-all solution. We can take this out of a box and we can place it down in Amsterdam, we can place it down in Dublin, we can place it down in Boston, we can place it down in Delhi, and it will all work in the same kind of way. So it treats cities as generic markets, and it treats cities as if they're bounded entities as opposed to being uh, uh, systems that are uh, complexly interdependent and interwoven into city regions and actually across uh, the globe. And often they're idealised these kind of... Uh, around an imaginary of greenfield developments rather than uh, the complexities of established communities, competing interests and legacy infrastructure and so on. As I already said, like the cities are quite uh, diverse in terms of their culture, their politics, their mode of governance and so on, which means how they can be deployed in different places is actually different. And while you might have a kind of a generalizable model, there still needs to be bespoke solutions built uh, onto them. Uh, fifthly is around kind of uh, reinforcing power geometries and uh, inequalities. So this critique uh, basically asks the question of who are these smart cities being created for? So in terms of for whom in terms of profit and but for whom in terms of the services that are being uh, delivered? And there's a real uh, question around the extent to which they serve uh, uh, certain vested interests and that one of those vested interests might well be the state in terms of security and safety and so on. Um, and the extent to which they're being used to control and regulate uh, uh, particular populations. In some cases, all populations, and in some cases, uh, selected populations. And the extent to which it actively marginalizes and dispossesses some. Okay, so these are two pictor pictorial visions of India. Of India. So this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the representations of one of the future smart cities in India. This is the present situation of large chunks of Indian cities. This does not include slums. This includes mass demolition of slums and then these people finding somewhere else to live that's not defined, but they won't be living here. And often there's land dispossession going on. And there's been cases now with like land being dispossessed off of farmers and so on without uh, compensation and so on. So there's real questions around uh, what's going on in here. And in a lot of cases, what's going on is real estate speculation, property market, uh, and so on. So that probably should have been six, I think. I've got my numbers mixed up here. Uh, seven is around uh, social, political, ethical effects. So as I probably already intimated from the beginning, we're, we're generating large amounts of data here that's indexical data. So they they could be uniquely tied to people, to objects, to places, to, uh, and, uh, to transactions, and so on. So there's a, the possibilities of large-scale surveillance and the erosion of privacy. And I'm using privacy here in its diverse forms. So there's lots of ways in which privacy can be eroded. Um, and then there's also questions around ownership and control of, of, those, of those data and the extent to which they end up in data markets. Okay, so there are now uh, many large, uh, you know, there's a large multi-billion dollar industry around the trading of uh, data. Um, and some companies would claim to have uh, very large uh, uh, data banks on individuals. So a company like Axicom would claim 
now my data is slightly old now, about 2012, uh, they were claiming that they had uh, 1,500 data points on 500 million people. A data point is white, male, 45, dot, 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 right? Okay, and they would also claim they have a 360 degree view. So they would claim they would have online, offline, and mobile data. So they would, they basically knew what you were doing offline in terms of what you were shopping, what you were buying, what your health insurance was, uh, what schools you went to, where you were working, where you were living, and so on. They do online in terms of your social media, so they're buying, they're buying data from Facebook and Twitter and so on. And they, they have mobile in terms of what's on your smartphone and where you're moving and other data that they're buying from um, companies that track mo uh, mobility. And then this data is then being used to predictively profile people and then to differentially treat people. Uh, so things like social sorting, but also spatial sorting. So there was a, uh, one of the examples uh, that the Wall Street Journal covered was about uh, if you were buying online from Staples, they were looking at where you were buying from, and depending on where you're buying from, you would get a different price. So if you have a dynamic pricing going on based on your physical location and then a profile of who, who they think you are and what you're prepared to pay. Okay, so this is socially sorts people. But we're also socially sorting people in terms of who gets the job, who gets the apartment, who gets the loan, and so on. So there's life decision... Uh, life decisions being uh, made on the, back, on the back of these data markets. Okay? And they're also being used for things like anticipatory governance. So anticipatory governance is, uh, is things like predictive policing. It's about trying to judge what somebody might do in the future. And a number of US police forces now are using predictive uh, profiling. They're doing it around predictively profiling what areas should be policed, but they're also predictively profiling which individuals need to be uh, monitored. So for example, in Chicago, they run a program called Pre-Criminals. And in Pre-Criminals, they're using a mix of social network data and arrest data and other kinds of data to work out the social network and to work out who they think either is a criminal and has not come on their radar or who they think might become a future criminal. And then they're actually going and knocking on the door and saying, look, we're already watching you. Okay, so this is, this is now making a, a kind of a pre-judgment about how people might act. So there's a form of kind of data determinism going on where you're making decisions about people on the assumption of what they might do as opposed to what they've actually done. Okay, so it's kind of interesting stuff. There's obviously a lot of nudge stuff going on in things like advertising and uh, uh, kind of promotion kinds of things, trying to nudge people towards certain kinds of purchases and certain, certain kinds of sales and so on. Uh, already mentioned dynamic pricing. Um, and then there's a whole series of issues around data security. And, uh, you know, if you're collecting very large amounts of this data, to what extent is it secure? And we're almost hearing every week of 20 million records have been stolen, 100 million records have been stolen, and then there's a whole series of knock-on consequences around identity theft uh, and so on. And then there's issues around control creep. So control creep is technology designed for one purpose, slowly being crept and rolled out into other kinds of purposes. So an example of that would be uh, the, con the congestion charge cameras in London which is, were installed on the basis that they would never be used for policing or terrorism, which are now obviously fully used for policing and terrorism. So they've shifted from one function into another, and lots of technologies start to creep across and do other kinds of things. So there's lots of kind of ethical questions in here around what happens with people's uh, uh, data and how that data is used, and how it's used in ways that weren't anticipated, and in ways that actually break all kinds of data uh, uh, regulation. So one of the principles in the EU, for example, is data minimization, which is the data can only be used for the purpose for which it was generated. Well, big data is actually all about repurposing data for other uses. Okay, so it's breaking one of the fundamental rules of uh, ha uh, data protection, basically. So this is just to give you an idea about how some of our movement is being tracked. So if I, if I, you know, if I was to go back 20 years ago or 30 years ago and I wanted to track anybody in this room, I probably would have had to hire a private detective and they would have had to shadow you and it would have been really expensive okay? and really time consuming. Whereas now our, our movement is being tracked all the time. Um, so we have things like controllable digital CCTV cameras, so cameras you can move around, zoom in, pan out and so on, has automatic number plate recognition on, has facial recognition on. Um, the whole series of cities now got facial recognition embedded in on the back ends of the, of the camera system. Your smartphones can be tracked through cell mass, through GPS, through its Wi-Fi connections, so the Wi-Fi points it tries to connect to. Uh, we have sensor networks, so we might have sensors on bins or lampposts that capture and track phone identifiers, such as MAC addresses. 
Uh, there's a good example of this in London where a company installed uh, 200 bins with these MAC address um, sensors on them. And they claim to have uh, tracked 4 million unique devices across the city in a single week from bin to bin to bin to shop to bin to shop to bin. And they claim they could tell you how long you've been inside each individual shop. Uh, Wi-Fi meshes, so capturing and tracking uh, phones using the, using the Wi-Fi mesh. Smart card tracking, so tapping in, tapping out of, a, of an underground or onto, on, on and off a bus, or swiping your card in and out of a building. Uh, things like vehicle tracking, so unique ID transponders on the front of uh, your car or, your, or a bus or whatever it might be. So when you approach, it automatically opens the barrier and deducts a payment, or when you go into a car park. All of the kinds of staging points, so using an ATM, using a credit card, metadata tagging. So if you take a photo on your phone, the XFIF um, metadata in the phone gives it location and the time of where the, where the photo was taken. So people have been doing things like scraping Flickr photos and then using them to trace where people have been because they've got the time and the date stamp embedded into the photos. And then obviously things like electronic tagging and shared calendars. Like if you're using a shared calendar on Google, Google knows everywhere you've been because you've, you've told them. Okay, so there's lots of different ways in which our data is now being tracked. And what kind of protects us at the minute is this is across lots of different, eight different entities and it's difficult to tie them up. But there's, a, there's at least 65 different companies in the US specializing in data, data brokers that specialize in location tracking alone. So they, these are companies that specialize in trying to track uh, where people are. So this, this, this data is actually going onto, onto open markets and is being sold and traded. And then lastly, there's a notion to which extent these cities are buggy, buggy and hackable. So we're taking two very open systems, software, which we know is open to viruses, to bugs, to hacks, uh, glitches, uh, to crashes, and so on, and then we're merging them with another open system, cities. And then there's a question as to uh, to what extent are, you know, are these going to really create robust, uh, stable uh, systems. And we now have a whole series of, um, of um, incidences of bits of software being hacked, so traffic lights being hacked, water treatment systems being hacked, uh, and so on. And we know that things like the electricity grid is almost under con constant attack. So cybersecurity on these systems is going to be a really pressing issue. We also know with things like legacy systems that a lot of the legacy systems have got things like the user manufacturer, the default user manufacturer password and default uh, username on it and so on. We have old bits of systems using Windows XP and NT and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, so it's all potentially hackable. So there's real issues here around uh, increasing kind of privacy stuff and increasing cybersecurity stuff. That's of course not to say that we shouldn't still roll it out, but it is to say that we need to be uh, aware and alive to the issues as to what potentially might happen with some of these uh, systems. Okay, so I kind of give you the positive of, look, this is the promise, we can create a better, more sustainable, more resilient, more efficient, more competitive, more productive city, but these are the potential costs in terms of how we change our governance, how we change how we manage, how we think about the city, um, how, uh, uh, who the city is for, um, uh, and some kind of ethical issues and so on. And the real question is, is how do you balance those two things out, right? Because nobody's going to say, don't do smart cities. And in fact, it's too late to say we can't do smart cities. A lot of this technology is already rolled out. It's already embedded in cities. We're already living with it. The smart city isn't something in the future. The smart city is something we're living with right now. What we can do, though, is think about how we want to uh, continue to roll that out and to continue to think about um, what kind of city we want and, uh, uh, and how we want to um, bring that city into existence. So, so this is the kind of the final part is, is, you know, the pendulum's gone this way, the pendulum's gone that way, how do we get the pendulum somewhere in the middle sl more towards the positive than to the negative, okay? So, you know, we can't abandon the notion of a smart city, and I think what we really need to be doing is kind of reimagining and reframing them and then trying to address their shortcomings. So I'm going to do this in uh, five ways, really. The first is around reframing goals. The second is about reframing cities. The third is about uh, management governance. The fourth one is about epistemology. Uh, and the last one is about ethical and security uh, challenges. So reframing the goals is really about normative questions. 
It's about what kind of cities we want to live in and who do we think these cities are for. Are these, are these, is smart city technology about new markets and profit? Is it about state regulation and control? Is it about citizens and quality of life? Is it about all three of those things? What, what's the blend of those things? Uh, and so on. You know, so what kind of city do we want to create and live in? Um, and I think part of the solution here is to start to set some of the thinking within a kind of social justice citizen frame, uh, framework, not simply within the framework of management, governance, and economy. So actually, and there already has been quite a bit of pushback and, and, and people saying, look, we need to start thinking about citizen citizen-centric smart cities or city, citizen-engaged smart cities. And that's partly about, about this. But it's partly about asking these questions of when we're thinking of procuring or developing these technologies, starting to think through some of these issues and embedding them into the, uh, embedding them into the thinking right from the start, as opposed to rolling out, the, uh, rolling out a system and then trying to retro-work it back around again. The second is I think we need to kind of reframe how we think about cities. And we need to acknowledge that they are complex open systems and they're not, you know, they're not just simply technical systems that can be solved with technical solutions, that we need a more kind of holistic way of viewing them. They're, they can't just be simply steered and controlled. We have to recognize that they are complex, they're ever evolving, they're interdependent contingent systems. And they are full of culture and politics and competing interests and wicked uh, problems. And they often unfold in quite unpredictable ways. Um, and I think the smart city tech and the discourses need to kind of shift to recognize and accommodate a more nuanced relational understanding of cities. Okay, so, the, so um, yeah, just to try and think about cities as, as they really are, as opposed to trying to break them down into these uh, narrow building blocks. We also kind of need to think a bit about uh, issues around management and governance. So this issue of kind of uh, uh, trying this idea of steering the city with these uh, kind of data levers in a, in a very kind of controlled uh, uh, way, which is often quite top down. We have a whole uh, we have a number of cities now who are doing things like uh, they have like weekly dashboard meetings. So they, I, was, uh, I mentioned this this morning. So somewhere like uh, Atlanta has a purpose built dashboard room. They meet once a week. Every, every head of every division is brought in. They showed the data of their performance for the week before and asked to account for it and what they're going to do the following week and so on. It's a very instrumental, mechanistic way of trying to run a, run a city off of KPIs. And it's probably not the ideal way of, do, of doing it. It's probably much more useful to use this data contextually in the context of lots of other data, lots of kind of policy considerations, lots of uh, other kinds of... Uh, consideration. So it's about co-creation, it's about co-production, it's about citizens engaged. It's not about the vision of a company flattened onto a city or the vision of a, of a particular state just lumped onto the city. It's about trying to uh, think about the range of various, various um, uh, interests. And it's obviously used in conjunction with things like deliberative democracy, policy changes, social and political interventions, other kinds of investments, and so on. It's about thinking about flexible and below, uh, uh, bespoke solutions, and also thinking about how you layer onto legacy systems. Because in, in most cases, what we're talking about is retrofitting existing cities. And it can be quite difficult to, leg, uh, to layer onto existing systems. So when Dublin was looking at smart lighting, one of the things it hadn't anticipated is, for a chunk of the city, the electricity grid is 60, 70, 80 years old and you can't layer on a command and control system onto it. So if you want smart lighting, you have to actually replace your energy grid Okay, so there's a legacy issue that then creates downstream uh, effects and so on. Um, and it's about thinking about things like open platforms, open standards, uh, to create interoperability, to create plug and play, rather than having closed proprietary systems and so on. And I think it's about having a well-developed smart city, uh, city vision that's been developed by the city as a, as a kind of consultative stakeholder uh, process so there's a kind of a collective view of developing out of what kind of smart city we want. So we have a vision. We then create a strategy on that. Uh, we have a kind of advisory board. We have, uh, uh, we have a way of then rolling that out. So we kind of, rather than us having kind of siloed, bespoke uh, solutions happening all over the place, and this is what's happening in Dublin. So what's happened in Dublin over the last year, really, is we've moved from being the accidental smart city to being a smart city with a vision and a plan. 
So we had all of these different bits of technology being used in different departments across the four different local authorities, all with no linking up between them without even knowing what each other was doing, and then trying to bring that together and try to create a coordinated plan and, to, and a roadmap as to where things might go. So go from accidental to planned. And I think we need to kind of reframe some of the epistemology. And so this is the kind of the, if you like, the urban science behind uh, smart cities. So this is how we kind of know and come to know and predict the city. So it's really about kind of urban science and informatics, um, which to a large degree is quite reductionist, mechanic, uh, mechanistic, atomizing, essentialist, deterministic, and so on. And it produces quite a limited and limiting understanding of cities. Um, of course, it's not without useful value. It's incredibly useful and valuable. I mean, I wouldn't be spending a lot of time building the Dublin dashboard if I didn't think that data and the analytics off of it wasn't useful. But I also think that we need to kind of think about how we understand the data within that system and how we understand what we do with that data in the system. Um, so it's about recognizing the kind of the situatedness or the positionality of what's uh, happening there. And, and it's not asserting that this kind of information or knowledge is more valuable than other kinds of information and knowledge. It's just, uh, it's, it's different if you like. And it can be used and combined in lots of different, uh, uh, lots of different ways. Uh, this was a, just an example of one of the technical shortcomings. So this, is, so, so this is like an example of how you can kind of lie with data on the, on the right-hand side. So this is, this is your objective neutral data within the context of a dashboard. It's in, in fact exactly the same data at three different scales. But how you view the images would give you a different interpretation. So this is actually unemployment data at electoral division, numerator district, and small areas in, in one part of Dublin. And if I was going to do things like area targeted initiatives around unemployment, I would probably be looking at this area until I get to this map. So this is over 45% unemployment, over 45% unemployment, less than 5% unemployment. Actually, I wouldn't want to stick anything there. And it's an effect of this tiny little area here is skewing that data. Okay, and this is, how you, this, is, this is how you gain benchmarks. If you're in a city and you want to gain benchmarks, this is how you gain benchmarks. So if I was to gain Dublin's rating on unemployment, I could return uh, Dublin City Council, I could, could refer, I could return the four local authorities, or I could refer to the Greater Dublin Region, or I could, or I could return Dublin County. I'd have a different unemployment rate for each of those four entities, and which one I would return to say Eurostat would make a difference to where my city was ranked. Okay. So that's how objective and neutral that is. And of course, how I measure unemployment makes a big difference. So Margaret Thatcher famously uh, altered uh, how unemployment was measured in Britain. I think she altered it 12 times in 18 months to basically get the unemployment figure below 3 million. She just kept on altering the measurement technique. But of course, it was scientific and objective, right? Because it was done with an equation. Okay. And then there are issues around uh, assessing, uh, addressing these kind of ethical and security concerns. And again, I think there's four, four levels of solutions. So one level is the market. It's about industry standards and regulation, but it's also about the market seeing privacy and security as a competitive advantage, about something that they should be concerned about and that they can uh, sell their services on the back of. It's about technological solutions, so proper end-to-end -end encryption, access control, security controls, audit trails, and so on. It's about privacy enhancement tools. It's about po new policies and regulations, so things like fair, the fair information practice principles actually being honored, but also things like privacy by design and security by design. So privacy by design is all the privacy settings on my phone are on as, a as, a, as the manufacturer de default. At the minute, all, uh, all the things are open, and then I have to close them down. So rather than it being open, its default is closed, and then I choose whether I want to share the data or not. The minute the default is I share the data. Okay? And security by design is the same thing. You build the security into the system right from the very get-go. You don't develop the system and then try to work out how you make it secure. So you're thinking about it right from the very uh, start. And that's why there is a lot of weaknesses in some systems, is the security is an afterthought rather than uh, built in. And then there are obviously governance issues, so things like oversight and delivery compliance, so smart city governance ethics security oversight committees, and so on. And this is the notion that the city itself, the city management, takes the responsibility of negotiating the ethics on behalf of the citizens. So when they procure a system, they set, the, they set within the procurement, 
this is what data you can collect, this is what you can do with this data, this is what we derive from this data, this is where this data can be stored, this is who the data can be shared with, okay? Rather than just, here's the data, do what you want with it. So, so they have the ability then to uh, uh, kind of aid in this kind of ethics security, particularly where notice and consent is absent in some of these technologies. No, no, the automatic number plate recognition cameras are not asking me permission to, to scan my number plate. They're just doing it. There's no notice and consent. So it's incumbent on the city then, I think, to negotiate that on behalf of their citizens. Okay, so just to conclude. So I think we're entering into an era of uh, embedded and uh, mobile computation. I think that we are now at the stage where we're starting to see vast quantities of real-time data being generated. And cities are starting to become much more responsive to these data and they are enabling new kinds of monitoring and regulation and control, and they're new, enabling new forms of operational uh, governance and how we kind of manage and, and uh, uh, deliver uh, city uh, services. And while they undoubt, you know, smart city technologies undoubtedly provide a whole set of solutions, and it's quite clear that they do, like if, if we were to get rid of the intelligent transport system in Dublin, it will be gridlocked, right? Like that technology is, in, you know, is really useful uh, technology. Uh, for, for making the city uh, work. And things like smart meters and so on have real benefits around energy saving and sustainability, both for consumers and for energy companies and so on. So there are real benefits out of these technologies, but they also raise, I think, a whole series of fundamental uh, normative and ethical uh, questions. And I don't think we've been done enough to think through those things. And a lot of this technology has been rolled out very, very quickly, and then we're trying to do catch up on it afterwards. Uh, and then start to kind of work through. And we need to kind of get better at thinking through some of the implications and how we uh, manage them. So the challenge really is to kind of realize the benefits while also uh, uh, minimizing the more, uh, maybe some of the more pernicious uh, effects. And the real challenge is to kind of create this kind of cities that we all want to kind of live and work and play in. So we need to get smarter about smart cities. Thanks. Um, I don't know what your feeling is, but I, I get a certain feeling of unrest here. Uh, uh, I think, I think, in a certain sense, in the balance, uh, uh, in the balance sheet, uh, there is more. Well, what's, what keeps on hanging in my head is more the negative side and the positive side about this. And perhaps in the discussion we can come back to this. Uh, but we first have somebody uh, feeding our discussion. Albert, uh, may I ask you to take the floor and the microphone? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, very nice to be here. Uh, Rob? My compliments with a, with a great introduction about this, this extensive topic, so I think you covered a lot of ground. Um, you also made it difficult for me because I think you, you, you pinpointed all, many, of the, um, many of the opportunities but also the perils, so um, I had to think quite a bit before I could think of something that, that I could add to this, uh, to this conversation. Um, and what I would actually like to do is, is two things that I think follow up quite nicely on what, what Rob has been doing. Um, one thing that I want to do is, is take up the challenge of reframing what the smart city is about. Um, what I did one year ago, as, um, as Hans referred to, is I did an inaugural lecture in, in Utrecht on um, Bestuur in the Data Polis, Governance in the Data Polis. Um, there's eight copies here, so it's sort of a running contest after this, this meeting, who's here first gets a chance. So you have eight chances to run for this book, um, but it's available online, of course, so you can you just Google it and you can find it as well. Um, but what I, what I did in my inaugural lecture is I tried to develop a new conceptual understanding of the smart city, because I think what hinders us in, in trying to get an understanding of the smart city is that it's such a normative concept. Um, 
No city wants to be a stupid city. Every city wants to be a smart city. So smartness is being reconstructed again and again. Uh, there are different meanings for, for smartness, but I don't think it really helps us to understand what is going on. Um, so I developed this new concept, the data polis, and um, I hope to convince you that it can help to get a, a richer or a better understanding of these, all these developments that uh, Rob talked about and that are taking place in cities at the moment. Um, and a second thing that I would like to do in this, in this brief presentation is to, um, uh, to describe three specific challenges. Because um, I think Rob beautifully indicated where we need to go and how we should uh, uh, construct smartest cities in a very nuanced and well thought way. But I think there's also some tensions, some things where it's very difficult to do the right thing because there's, there's opposing forces. And I think those can also help to, to, to trigger the discussion. So I would like to, to present three of these challenges that do not really have a right answer and that are really some of the problems that our city, cities are struggling with at the moment. Um, but let me start with, the, um, um, with my perspective. Um, uh, I work at uh, Utrecht School of Governance, so I'm a governance scholar, you could also say a scholar of public administration. And um, well, to be clear about what a governance scholar is, I would like to sort of uh, uh, contrast it with, with some other perspective on cities. And I think when you talk about smart cities, a very dominant perspective is the engineering perspective. And I, I think Rob also gave some good indications. The engineering perspective is basically that problems can be solved by good analysis, good design, good thinking. Ratio is at the heart of, uh, rational thinking is at the heart of solving problems in cities. And many of the proponents of smart city technologies really talk about from this engineering perspective. They feel that a city has an objective, uh, city urban problems can be solved when we have the right uh, analysis. Um, Rob talked about Morozov's concept of solution, solutionism, the idea that uh, technology is the solution to all and that's really the, the engineering perspective. On the other hand, there's the political science perspective. And the political scientists would say, no, it's not about the technology, it's not about rational analysis, it's about power. And it's about opposing values, and uh, those in power try to form the, the, the cities according to, to their preferences. Um, groups with less power try to uh, mobilize other forces, try to develop uh, political strategies to form the city in the way they want. So a city is not so much about a rational analysis, it's, a, it's an arena where a fight is taking place between different uh, opposing forces. Um, the perspective that we take as governance scholars is that it's both. If we want to understand what the smart city is about, we should understand that it's both about what we call powering and puzzling. It's both about the power play, the arena that's taking place, but it's also about puzzling, about finding the right way to certain solution. And the interaction between powering and puzzling is that something that, that we need to understand. So our central concept is actually um, co collaboration, um, or you could say collaborative governance. So we're really trying to find out under what situations can people that have contrasting value preferences, contrasting uh, power position, when are they still able to collaborate and to make for a better world. That, that's basically what, what, what we're trying to understand from a governance perspective. And then if you look at the, uh, the smart city, I think we need to go back to sort of a, a deep understanding of what a smart city is about. Um, and that's why I want to go back to this old concept of the polis, um, the idea of citizens coming together, talking about what they want to do in a city, talking about ways to protect both their personal interests and realize collective goods so that they can do that together. Um, and the interesting thing is, um, one of my students held a presentation about uh, smart cities, and before he did that, he, as, well, as many of us did, do, he Googled smart cities with um, uh, Google, uh, Google pictures, um, but what he found was only pictures of buildings and technologies. And I think that is very interesting. When we talk about smart cities, well, in the end, people may play a role, but the way we imagine smart cities is cities without, uh, without uh, people. That's also why here on this, on this book, on my inaugural lecture, uh, I took a painting, an Italian painting of the ideal city, um, and this is a Renaissance painting. It also shows a city without people. There is 
there is one pigeon somewhere in the painting, but uh, it's very difficult to find. If, if you see the real painting, you, you can find it. It's difficult to find on, on, this, on this picture. Um, but it's interesting. I think that fits also the engineering pers perspective. Engineers focus on buildings, technologies, systems, but, but not on people. And I think we need sort of a more people-centered perspective on, on the city to understand what, what's going on. And that's why we work um, in, in, in governance studies with the idea of the polis. And so the polis is about um, uh, people solving problems in cities. Um, but the interesting thing is that we've moved far from this situation where people could all come together and discuss how they want to deal with problems in, in, in the city to a situation where we're talking about cities with millions of people uh, with very different interests, very different positions. Sometimes they don't even speak the same language. So it's, it's a very, very different situation. And in the modern polis, data have come to play, play a key role. So data are very, have become very important, as, as Rob has really shown, Data have become important, for, for example, in terms of what we're going to decide. Predictive policing is really about using data to make good decisions about policing. Um, data are used for implementation. Mobility systems use data for smart choices in, uh, in guiding uh, traffic through the city. But data are also important in terms of what comes to the agenda. What are the problems that we're going to talk about? And in this sense, the notion of the politics of visibility is very important because the data determine what is real in the city? I think that's a very, very important to understand this. Things that are captured in the data exist, can come on the political and governance agenda, and we can make decisions about these issues. But if the phenomenon cannot be captured in data, it does not exist. So that we need to understand these politics of visibility, and we need to understand how data condition governance. But it's also the other way around. Also, the, the fact, why do we construct certain data systems? Um, um, why do we want cameras in certain neighborhoods and fewer cameras in other neighborhoods? Uh, why um, is garbage collection measured in certain ways? The uh, data st systems that are constructed should also be understood as resulting from governance arrangements. And this means that there's two important questions. How does the polis condition data systems? How does the do the data systems condition the polis? So these are the two crucial questions that we should focus on. And to understand emerging patterns, we should understand these do influence each other and lead to unexpected emergent forms because they work both ways. Um, and going one step further to, to have a sort of a basic understanding of this polis, we should understand that every city nowadays consists of three types of steering arrangements. There's the state, the idea of a, um, a legitimate government that takes certain decisions and implements, certain, uh, implements these decisions to make for better healthcare systems, better mobility, et cetera. But there's also the market. The market provides for, uh, for food, for uh, all kinds of services that we need in a city. And then there's civil society, the idea that we work together in neighborhoods to, uh, uh, to integrate neighborhoods, to um, have green parks together, or to have sport clubs. So people always work, also work together to create all kinds of benefits. Um, so this is a very classical perspective on the polis. But the interesting thing is if you, if you look at the data polis from this perspective, you see that different things are happening. The center of operations in Rio that Rob also mentioned it's really a classic perspective of state perspective on the data polis. The idea is that government should take care of uh, emergency situations in the city, and for that reason, the government needs good information system. But there's also different things happening. Waze, also mentioned by, by Rob, started as a citizen initiative, but is now uh, owned by, by, by Google, and they, um, they use it to, to make money through advertisement and through different ways. So this is a commercial system, but it plays a key role in steering mobility in the city because people use it to drive around traffic jams and to find uh, short routes to where they want to go. So smart city is not only about the state using new technology, it's also about new commercial solutions being developed in the, in the private, in the, in the, on the market. And a third thing is also the um, civil society. Um, uh, but this is neighborhood prevention, neighborhood watch, 
WhatsApp is used for, uh, by, by citizens to create safer neighborhoods. They're working together to create these safe neighborhoods. Um, and what I think is important is that the perils do not only come from the state. This is what we tend to think of. The perils are big brother. Is the big brother peril is still very much there. We think about government using technology. It's a very short route to the idea of big brother. So that, that is a risk. But there are other risks. This one is the, the, the risk of selling out to big corporations about uh, booking time to decide how we're going to use houses in, in Amsterdam. Um, Uber as a new way of, uh, uh, of uh, arranging traffic in cities. So this is the, the risk of selling out to, um, to big corporations. But there's also a risk here. We tend to sort of have this idea of citizens working together that it's only a very positive thing. We talk about a participation society, citizens getting engaged. But when you look at these groups, it, it's always certain citizens. If there's a group where there are problems between, for example, North African youths and, 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 um, and white people that live there, it's the white people that organize themselves in these WhatsApp groups, and they use it to monitor what the uh, North, uh, North African youths are doing there. So it creates new contradictions between these groups in a city. It's not only like there is no such idea as a homogeneous group of citizens. There are different citizens with different interests, and in that way, it cre also creates risks. Um, so it's a very complicated issue that we need, need to understand from these different angles. But to bring it back to something that we can develop further in this discussion, I would like to bring, present three specific challenges. And the first challenge is, is what I would call the, the inclusion challenge. Um, Rob clearly indicated that there are risks of ex exclusion. I think the, 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 um, the example of the slums in India is, is, is very telling. It's a, a smart city being built for rich people in India, and the people in slums just disappear. It's not clear where they're going. Um, so when we talk about smart city, many people will highlight, okay, but it should be a smart city for all citizens. We should not exclude certain groups because they do not have access to technology or because we don't want them in a city. It should be open to everyone. So it's a, it's a very positive way of putting it. But at the same time, if we only focus on, on making it inclusive, it could also uh, form a barrier to developing interesting solutions. And to give you a concrete example, I've looked at the use of uh, Twitter, social media, by the police to connect to citizens. And on the one hand, you could say, well, this is, creates a new uh, uh, divide between citizens because it means the police are working with citizens that use Twitter, that have a mobile phone, and other people do not have. Uh, well, most people have a mobile phone, but many people do not use, use Twitter. So it could create a divide between different groups of people using this medium. At the same time, you could say, well, but it is a very good way for the police to connect much better to large groups of citizens. And there's many people that they can reach. And um, we've done some research, and there's, uh, there's more than a million people following uh, police tweets in, in the Netherlands. So it's, it's, a, it's a very large group. And then the question becomes, should we not use social media to communicate with, this, with these million citizens because there's many other people that we will not reach with Twitter? Or do we accept that there are certain people that we cannot reach because there are benefits for these other citizens? So how far do we go in this idea of inclusion? And can the idea of inclusion not form a barrier to further developing the smart city? I think that's one, one important challenge. The second challenge is what I call the, the multi-level challenge. Um, I also thought about the standardization challenge, but I think it's more than standardization. The picture here refers to standardization. The, um, well, the irritation that we all feel when you go to another country and you forgot to, to bring um, the, the, the thing that you need to plug in when you go to the UK or the US and then you cannot, you, you cannot load, yeah, you cannot charge your iPad because you don't have the right plug-in. That's very irritating. So we want it all standardized and in, in the same way. And uh, I know there's a lot of people that are saying, when we talk about smart cities, we should standardize smart city technologies. Avert John de Mulder sitting over there, he's a very strong proponent of uh, standardization of smart city technologies as a, as a way of pushing it forward and, and making sure that we, we, we come to good solutions. On the other hand, one could say, yeah, but standardization also blocks local initiatives. Uh, we, we talked about local sensitivity, developing things that work in, in, in a local context. And you could say, for example, when we look at the local area networks, the Internet of Things, uh, there are great initiatives now in, in Amsterdam and Groningen where, cities are developing, where citizens are developing their own Internets of Things. Um, 
Yeah, should they do that by their own with the risk of having very different internets of things that cannot be connected? This, the urban dashboards that uh, Rob talked about, well, each and every city is going to develop an urban dashboard. There's no way that we can compare all these cities, so that could be a disadvantage. So you could say, no, we need to standardize. Well, standardization has an, has an advantage, and um, I call it multi-level because it means that we have to take decisions at a higher level for, for all cities. At the same time, it could stop local, in, in local innovation. So how are we going to deal with this tension of stimulating local innovation, but at the same time um, uh, having collaboration or uh, ad uh, uh, connections between these different local initiatives? And the third challenge is what I call the information challenge. Connects well to your, your um, um, ep epistemological reframing. Um, when we talk about the city, or the way actually people interact, is much more about stories than about numbers. Um, um, a colleague has evaluated the impact of, uh, of a research in public administration, and what he found is that the, uh, the um, articles that were based on, uh, on a quantitative analysis made much less of an impact than the stories. I know well for uh, PBL, of course, the idea of making stories on the basis of information is, is, is very important. But when it comes to the city, um, people often have stories that do not fall, fully uh, connect to the data. Um, and a a well-known example is the idea of, of urban safety. Um, the data often show that cities are becoming safer and safer, but people feel very unsafe. Um, does that mean they're wrong? Does that mean we're, we're get, we need to confront them with the data and say, okay, well, you feel unsafer, but you're wrong because the city is getting safer? Or should we take these stories seriously? And should we give more room to contradictory experiential data? And how are we going to create that connection? And that, do we sometimes mean that we will reject quantitative uh, uh, evidence? because the stories are different, and how we're going to work with this connection. So to conclude, I would say the subject of the smart city or the data polis is uh, too important to leave to the uh, technological heroes that come here to solve the cities and make them more sustainable and richer and, uh, and safer, etc. I think we need to accept that it's a complicated issue, and it means that we need um, proven uh, mechanisms of local of democracy that we need to engage. So it's much more about stronger forms of participatory democracy. Uh, have citizens uh, participate in experiments to get their opinion, to get their values, to understand what it means for them. It means also more emphasis on electoral uh, representative democracy. What I found, but maybe Rob, you found different things, but in the Netherlands I found that the whole topic of smart city is very much a technocratic topic. It's more a topic for civil servants than for politicians, which is, I think, a very interesting observation. And I think it's important to, to mobilize mechanisms of, of representative democracy to get the, the politicians and the political dynamics involved. Um, uh, for example, I looked at Eindhoven at the um, Living Lab Stratum Eind. Some of you may have heard of it. And I found it very interesting. There was no discussion whatsoever in the local city council. Everybody thought it was just a great idea to use technology to make the city safer. I think there should be discussion. And it should also be about deliberative democracy, and that's what, actually what we're doing here. Have a debate, have a better understanding of these different arguments to make the right choices. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Albert. Uh, Rob, could I, could I ask you for a very brief uh, uh, um, response to the presentation because because Albert was presenting something of a, of a new frame, the data polis, uh, as a way to, in, in a certain sense, uh, for us as citizens to get back into control again. I think that's that's a general idea, uh, uh, and I know from from this morning that you also had some ideas about this, the sort of further operationalization of how we could, as a public, get back into control again in relation to that data infrastructure. So a, a quick response, and then I want to open up to, to uh, the wider public. Yep. Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, um, your own mic, yeah. Yeah, this little thing tacked on my ear. Yeah. Um, so I think the two talks quite nicely dovetailed with each other, actually, and we were quite in sync, so there's, there's, there's not going to be a really big debate going on here. I expect the debate's going to be going on with some of the people who were scowling at us and uh, uh, when we were talking. Um, 
I think you're right about the issue of this is really seen as a, is, as a civil servant issue as opposed to a politician issue. Um, certainly the politicians within Dublin, this is, not in, this is not in their purview at, at all, actually. They're not really talking about this. this is a, and it's partly to do with governance. So Dublin is a city that's run by city managers. It's not run by mayors. So that makes a, that makes a difference. So that it's run by bureaucrats. It's not, it's not run by... It has elected officials who have a kind of a... So they have executive and a reserve function. So the city elected officials can kind of direct the city, but to a large degree, decisions are being made by by uh, city managers and uh, people in charge of particular departments and so on. So I, I think it is interesting that it has, to a large degree, bypassed politics. I think that I think that's I think that's largely uh, true. I think it's also largely bypassed citizens, and um, and in some cases it can come back in quite uh, strong ways. So I don't. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with what's been going on with smart metering with water in Ireland, but we've had protests of up to 100,000 people on the streets protesting about water metering, for example. Now, that's tied up in a whole series of other debates, and it's become the focus of, of other things. But, that, but that's, you know, it has, has some of this technology has come back up against protests and people saying, actually, we don't want this. We, we want water to be supplied through general taxation and not uh, metered and paid for on an individual basis. We're already paying for this through our taxes. So it's a political debate, but it also involves this kind of new technology being rolled out, which, which has affected smart metering being rolled out in other, in, uh, in other things as well, it makes a difference to being able to do it in electri electricity and so on. Um, so I think, I think that's kind of interesting. And I think the inclusion challenge, the multi-level challenge, the standardization challenge, I, I think the standardization thing is, uh, is necessary so I do think there has to be some degree of standardization around things like data formats, data standards, and, uh, and so on, in the, in the sense of these systems need to be plug and play. So I think what's interesting is, a, is the space around the platform. And what you don't want is that to be proprietary and locked down. You need it to be plug and play where there are open standards and open formats that anybody can then link their systems in and out. So it's about creating interoperability as opposed to one size fits all systems. So, so it allows for lots of different systems and lots of different ways of doing it, and it allows people to connect. So I think standardization in that sense is important because it's, it's important for scales of economy, for companies to be able to roll out solutions. But at the same time, they have to be able to be bespoke elements within it to adapt, uh, adapt to local conditions. And it has to be enable lots of different players in the same market to get into the space. So, you know, so that would still enable local innovation as well as, uh, and I think the information challenge, as we already said, is a, is a strong one. And I think, you, I think you, the idea of the polis is a really interesting way of coming at this and really focusing on this kind of where do we get the people, um, where do we get the people back in? And, and we've really not been very good at that. It's, it's largely absent in political debate and it's largely absent in uh, citizen engaged debate. And where, and where it has been with citizens, it's been around things like hackathons and uh, and so on, which is actually the same group. It tends to be the tech community, as opposed to ordinary, everyday people who are not in the tech industry. But, but th this morning, you also spoke about uh, uh, making data tracing more visible. If you walk through cities, they become aware of the way in which our data are tracked. And then there was also debate about, you know, is this allowed, yes or no? Uh, uh, do we ask permission to people for the data to be traced, etc., etc.? So that in, in the public domain, you have become much more aware of the way in which data are read in the public domain, and there is a debate going on about sort of the right to do this. Yeah, so there's been a few different debates about things like the right to be forgotten and, yeah. um, uh, and so on. So I don't think a lot of people are often aware of how much data is actually there, they're leaving behind them, and the extent to which their, um, their data is inside these data markets. And they are multi-billion dollar companies, and they are massive amounts of data are being held and they're, they're effectively black boxes we've no real idea what's going on inside of them um, if you were to do a google of some some uh, company like axicom which employs a, a huge number of people about 18,000 people i think uh, you'll find like two or three articles that'll be it you find the same for any of these data brokers they just don't turn up they're very difficult to get inside to find out what exactly they're doing um, what kind of services are selling how are they selling them and so on. And the only reason we know what goes on inside of Axicom is because uh, the FTC in the US 
subpoenaed 12 of those data broker companies to, to come before them to basically say, to, to find out what it was that they were doing. And Axicom, as a, as a strategic move, said, uh, opened up their databases to the public. So you as an individual could get your data from Axicom if you gave them more data. <laughs> so they wanted you to validate the data about you that they held, basically. Um, and a few journalists did it. And the journalists basically said, yes, they, they know where I went on holiday, they know what car I drive, they know where my kids go to school, they know what my health insurance plan is. And the only things that were kind of wrong were the stuff which were predictive. So where the company had used the data to then make predictions about how they voted or other, other kinds of things, and they were the things that were wrong. But the actual data about their purchases, what groceries they were buying, you know, and so on, they, they were all factually kind of correct. So, so we don't know what's going on in that space. I don't think most people know what's going on in that space. Most people don't know what's coming off their phone. Pretty, if you've got an Android phone, you've got, uh, and, uh, that's privacy, um, that's open by default, and everything is coming off. That you, you, an app on your phone can ask, uh, it doesn't have to ask for permission. It can, it can take everything, like your, your email log, your messaging log, your battery temperature, the Wi-Fi points you connect to, it strips off everything on the phone if you, if, if you don't lock it down. Maybe there was one interesting example in the Netherlands this, this, this week. It was in the newspaper, somebody um, objected to using um, uh, this, this electronic card for positioning his garbage bags in, in a central depository. So he said he didn't want to do that because he, well, he didn't want to be registered for how much garbage he was putting in, in, in the bin. So it went up to the highest court and in the end, he lost it because there was no formal legal basis for local government to use this pass. So in the end, you could say he also won it because it meant that there was no, they could not uh, force him to put the garbage in the bin. So he could put it next to it because there was no formal legal basis for using this electronic card. So I, I felt sometimes these, these discussions are quite uh, abstract, but this I think it was a very concrete example. That, that, that's what we need to get the discussion going because but I just have a key, a normal key for a central garbage bin, so there's no tracking, there's no data recording there, but other people have an have a, have a electronic card, so then local government has all these data. Mm. And I, think, I think when it comes so tangible, concrete, then people can get engaged in, in discussions. Mm. I have an RFID chip on my bin, and I get a statement that says, on this day you deposited 4.2 kilos, and it, mm. you know, so they, they, they can tell me what exactly Where was... Where did you get this from? <laughs> <laughs> In this, in this green box, there is a, a simple technological device. It's a mic. And it, it's sending the signals only to that post over there. So it's not being sent anywhere else. Until and the video is posted online and then everybody gets it. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to roll out this piece of technology to anybody who wants to use it to ask a question or give a remark or come up with some hope or... <laughs> Yes. Uh, I'm going to throw it, yes? Um, now my question is not about hope. If I hear this all, <laughs> I think it's very difficult to find a way out because we are living in a very neoliberal system and that drives technical innovation. And smart city is uh, now, a long time in the, is the focus is on technical innovation because also I think of the financial rendements or benefits uh, from that way of thinking. And it's not so easy to come, to come out of this. You can also see that the business model of most of the sharing initiatives, of it is Uber or it's Airbnb, is all driven by technical innovation and data that they use because you are more the product than the consumer. And I think, yeah, it's, it's very exciting times because we have the technology innovation to have more participatory governance, but I think at the, at the moment it's, uh, no, I see no hope at, uh, at all uh, at that point. I think it's interesting that you do this investigation and uh, kind of uh, agenda setting, but it's very difficult to find a way out of this, I think. Because you see also that the banking uh, system are not changed at all at the moment, and I think it's also part of this. Uh, smart city thinking. Yeah, so, I mean, in some ways, I, I can kind of sympathize with the, with the view. At the, other, at the other side, I would like to try and be more hopeful. 
I, in the sense of, I do think that this technology does offer, some of the technology does offer real benefits, right? And we, you know, cities wouldn't be investing in it and um, people wouldn't be using it if they didn't, right? People wouldn't be using their smartphones if they weren't willing to trade the convenience and so on against uh, the other issues, right? So it's a question of trying to how you... Yeah, but at the same time, you, we still do have law and we still do have regulation and we still do have policy and we do still have uh, deliberative de uh, democracy and uh, electoral democracy and so on, right? So there is a sense in which you can push back against things. And there are different jurisdictions that have said, no, actually, we're not doing that. Actually, Uber, you are not going to uh, be allowed to trade in our area unless you uh, comply with our labour law and you comply with our taxi regulations and so on. I used the example this morning of, say, like Japan, who said to Google, no, you can't do Street View. You cannot, you cannot be heard. Sorry, I can't come with, with the microphone. So, 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 so I think it is this balance the, between... This new sharing initiatives as, as Uber and Airbnb have extreme power because they are very networked, uh, organized, and they use also this technology to have this power and do... Yeah, but they don't, they don't hold the power of office. You know, so they, they, they hold a power of lobbying and they hold a, they hold a economic power in terms of how they can uh, 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 utilize their, their, um, how, they, how they do their market and so on. But they're, they're still accountable to uh, the elected office and to, uh, 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 to, to law and regulation and governance and so on. And, and there are situations where things have been shut down in the past where, so, so for example, those bins in London that were tracking four million people a week, they were given a cease and desist order and they, and, and they had to stop. Like the mayor of London basically just said, look, you've rolled this out without asking for any permission, without going through any kind of procedure, and actually we don't, uh, you know, we, we don't condone it and we want you to cease and desist. You know, so, so you can push back against the thing. So I wouldn't give up all hope on all that kind of stuff. I think, I think the whole thing around privacy has become a real live issue and people are becoming more aware about that and people are pushing back against that. And I think some companies are being, um, are also becoming more savvy about that and are seeing privacy as a competitive advantage. And there has been like some shift. Now, some of it is to do with the corporate, it suit, also suits a corporate interest as well as it suits. So things like um, some companies encrypting their data so that, so that like the US government can't get back ac backdoor access into their data and so on. And, and also saying that their data will be private and they won't share the data and so on and this. So you only need some companies who see it as a competitive advantage and then they get a large market share and everybody swaps. So some of these companies that come and go really fast, right? Who remembers MySpace before Facebook replaced it, right? You know, sort of X but, hundred but, million views. But I can, can give three, three concrete examples of things that I find because it now it becomes very gloomy and it's yeah. like, oh, it's yeah. all bad. That's what, yeah. One, three concrete examples. One, um, City of Utrecht uses big data to be more efficient in collecting what they call orphan bicycles. Those are bicycles that are left in the city. It's just tax money that's being sp spent to clean the city. It used to cost a lot more money. Now they're doing a big data analysis. They can use, they can do it at a lower cost and they offer better, better services because they collect the data more quickly. So that's, I find that a clear benefit. Second benefit, use of uh, infrastructure. Um, I think they did the time of building new roads is, is, is really coming to an end because we're finding smarter ways to use the available infrastructure. Um, but the experiment they're doing in Amsterdam where certain people go, take another route than other people so that there will not be a traffic jams and we can use the infrastructure. So instead of building more roads, we can use the roads more efficiently, which, which, which has all kinds of advantages in terms of cost, but also for the environment. And the third one is the, uh, well, the uh, electricity cooperatives that, that the PBL has also studied. It's very much an empowering technology where small groups of citizens are capable to set up their own energy production, something that was unthinkable of until, yeah, let's say 10 years ago. Now citizens are doing their own energy production. So those are three very concrete examples of, of, of benefits there are. So maybe this can sort of turn the discussion a little bit to, to these yeah. practices. Luckily, luckily, it opens up the discussion for another perspective. Uh, I, I just it, add, it became a bit gloomy. Yeah. But, but it, it, it I mean, I just add to that on our dashboard, for example, where we have all the data for the city. One of the reasons why we wanted to develop it was to work out how to do that where we could look at these kinds of issues. 
So there is no personal information within inside our dashboard, for example. So we, we wouldn't break any privacy or confidentiality thresholds within there at all. So, so we've been trying to work out ways in which you could do this and gain a lot of useful information, a lot of useful evidence about the city without creating some of these harms, these privacy harms and predictive privacy harms. Yes, I would like to add uh, something to th this point. Uh, and then I have a question for, for you too. Um, first of all, there are two uh, words in, in, in smart cities. Uh, smart, uh, there's smart in it. And you could say there is, uh, this is adding to the, maybe the growing power of the corporates on a global level. But that's not only due to technology. There's also cities, and cities are places where experimentation takes place. Experimentation which is helped by, uh, by technology. And there has been done some empirical research on how these ex experiments um, are directed towards different social groups. And there is, at this moment, no proof that it, there is a neoliberal agenda. Uh, there are all kinds of, uh, of different governments in cities, and often they even serve the lower classes. So there are many experiments where Local governments take the lead. They do this uh, in, in two thirds of the cases. They really take the lead in urban experimentation using techlo technologies as a means. And they're often directed towards uh, the people with lower incomes. For example, by isolating houses or putting PV panels on the, on the rooftops, all kinds of things. Uh, um, Albert mentioned three examples. But this is globally, there's empirical research that it's not really a neoliberal liberal, Agenda. But the neoliberal agenda is about marketization of public services. It's not about who you serve. Right? But Yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, my question is, I've been trying to grasp what the urban part of this whole story is. Why would it be specifically for cities and not mm -hmm. for society broader? And the only thing I can think of is, uh, maybe because I'm not a city person, so that's really a question, like what is so urban or city specific about this uh, smartness? And, and related to that, uh, the other question is, the thing I can think of is that there's less social coherence in cities, it's more individualistic, so my question would be, if you've seen any examples where actually these, these, this better access to information and sharing and networking is actually facilitating community building and more coherence and more social interaction in groups, for example. So that would be my question. Um, yeah, I, I, well, Two, two answers. One thing is there, there is indeed some, some evidence that, um, that uh, new technologies help to create this coherence in cities. For example, the, uh, the area where I live in, in Utrecht, um, uh, which is yeah, just behind the railway station, um, uh, there, uh, there has been a new citizen initiative to create what they call circular park. They're connecting different green zones in this area. And it has been partly based on face-to-face -face contacts. People that knew each other and started brainstorming about this idea. But they, the, the idea has really uh, gained some momentum because of the use of Facebook and because it was firmly established in the neighborhood and people started supporting it and hearing about it. So you see that, and there, there's other examples in Leiden, for example, people also worked on a similar type of initiatives. So there, there is some indication that social media can help to, to create these, these new contacts between citizens. Uh, but my second point would be, I actually agree with what you're saying. What I find interesting is much more the, um, the, the local aspect um, than, than sort of the urban aspect. We're doing some research in, in the province of Groningen, which is in the northeastern part where there's population decline, uh, there's uh, earthquakes, mind you, in, in the Netherlands. Um, so there, there's, there's severe problems there. But we're also uh, experimenting with the use of open data to support citizen initiatives to find new solutions to problems of population decline. And I think the, the interesting aspect is not so much urban, it's more um, locatedness. It's more about uh, locate, lo locations where different types of problems are being connected. Because what you see from sort of a, a national perspective, there's a, a, a policy for, uh, for, for safety or for health or for education. And what happens when you look, look at the local level, that all these aspects are directly connected. And I think that that's, that's more what, it makes, what makes it interesting. The, 
yeah, the integral nature of the approach to, to problems, much more than the urban issue. I just say that um, I think the reason why it ends up being a discussion about smart cities is, is partly there's a scale of economy within a city. So if you're going to roll out large scale um, kind of technical solutions for particular issues, there needs to be a certain level of deployment that would make it uh, financially viable. So there's a kind of financialization aspect to it. So I think there is a scale of economy issue around things like uh, uh, smart transport solutions, smart lighting solutions, smart energy grid solutions, and so on. That's not to say it doesn't happen in rural areas as well, or in small towns, and in um, uh, so like Mallow in in Ireland, for example, is a small town north of Cork that's become a kind of an IoT test bed and has been rolling out different bits of smart technology into quite a small um, uh, town, looking at things like smart lighting solutions uh, and so on. And in a lot of cases, the rural is actually more overdetermined by software than, or code than parts of the city are. If you're in agriculture, your, your, your entire life is driven through various bits of software stuff like, you know, so, form, so, so from like farm to fork traceability means you have to be able to tra trace in each individual animal. You, you, if you're claiming all your subsidies, you have to fill in loads of online forms to get, to get your money and so on. Like you're you're entirely within a surveillance grid if you're if you're in farming to a certain degree, uh, you know. So, you know, there's lots of um, there's lots of mechanisation and automation going on 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 farms now. You know, monitoring yield out of individual animals for milk yield, for example, and uh, and so on. And things like combine harvesters are basically just big computers on wheels now. You know, they're 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 calculating the yield per square meter of the field and all kinds of stuff. So there's lots going on in that space. Yeah. A question related to this one. Uh, let's say um, in, in Europe, one observes countries with, let's say, big uh, national capitals like uh, the UK or France, let's say, in which the national capital is really the big city. In the Netherlands or in Italy, you see we have many medium-sized cities that actually compete with, with each other. Do you think that, let's say, this makes a difference in, let's say, how a policy or a governance system, let's say, related to smart cities uh, could evolve? That's one question. And the second one is, let's say, we have seen these elections in Austria uh, uh, this week. Uh, and there you see, let's say, an emerging difference between uh, urban people, let's say, feeling comfortable what's happening in, the, in, in society, and uh, people in, in villages and older people feel, feeling very uncomfortable. And actually, that country is moving into different directions. And that could be an example, let's say, what, what, what will happen in, in Europe, let's say, with the Brexit, etc. Um, so, let's say, is this, let's say, feeling of uncomfortableness outside of the city, is this something we have to deal with? Or do you think this, this is something completely different and that's another topic? I hope there's not a tech solution to that. I think that's a political question, to be, to be honest. So it's largely a political and policy question. It's not, te 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 there's not going to be a tech solution to the far rise, I don't think. It's not going to be an app for it to fix it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a question. I, it's perhaps not a question about solution, but it's a question about this, this feeling of uncomfortably. Is that related to technology, yes or no? Is, is that, that related to yeah. globalization? Is that related yeah. to... Well, I, I think it relates to, to what I call the politics of visibility. What, what I found quite interesting is SCP, the, it's one of the uh, uh, knowledge institutes here in the Netherlands, they kept on communicating that everything was going well in this country, that, uh, that people were happy, and apparently they they done sound research and they... they and this is what the, what they found and what they communicated. But at the same time, was, there was no match with with what pe some many people felt. And I think that's that's why I brought up this uh, this idea of to what extent is there room for experiential data? I mean, the system should be able to listen to people, and that is different than to measure people. And I think the the, the capability of the these systems to to measure also different sentiments. Um, it becomes becomes very important, becomes crucial to, to these systems, because otherwise we only see certain things, and then policy decisions are even 
other issues will just not appear on the agenda. So the, the capability of systems to, to tap on into different ways of thinking and to connect to these ways of thinking are crucial. And the other issue about one central capital, different cities, I don't know, I would say it's a very empirical question, so I'll probably integrate that in my research again. That's something that, it, yeah, that we can investigate. I don't know the answer yet. Where, where the smart city might inflect on it to a certain degree is around economic development. So it's around, so, so there is this rural urban division in Ireland. There's a very strong sense that the rural has been left behind. And it's partly around uh, economic development. So it's seen that all the jobs are being created in the cities. And this is where the entrepreneurship is. This is where the creativity is. This is where the innovation is. This is where foreign direct investment is going. And it's not going to these other places. And if people want certain kinds of jobs, they have to move to the city. And so there's a sense of which they're being left behind. And, and the, the extent to which like, the smart city agenda might be driving that, you know, particularly in a city like Dublin, where we would have European headquarters for most of the major multinationals, you know, so all the tech companies, so Microsoft, IBM, Google, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Airbnb, they, they all have the you know, motor, they all have their Intel, UPAC, they all have their headquarters in Dublin, right? At the same time, those, those kind of companies need certain kind of skill sets. So if you're Intel and you're employing six or 7,000 people, you can only be in a city of uh, like a million people or more to, to, to get the, the skilled workforce that you would need. There's no point putting that in a town of 30,000 people when you're employing 7,000. They just wouldn't be able to get the skilled labor force that they would need. So it kind of reinforces that divide and it becomes a kind of self-fulfilling process. And I think some of the, you know, some of that tech, if you're, if you're around a startup economy, it's about whether you can have a, a, a vibrant startup economy within uh, certain r uh, rural areas. And again, whether you would be able to establish yourself and get the labor that you needed and establish the market that you, that you want and so on. So in that way, uh, there's probably a relationship. Um, yes, my name is uh, Evert John Mulln. I was earlier associated with the uh, aspect of standardization. That's not the most sexy uh, subject, but important. But I want to take the uh, discussion to uh, uh, an international competitive level. Here in The Hague, you cannot find one ministry or one strategy or political vision on the development of smart city. Uh, I think you have to go to Brussels, the EU, to find some kind of vision on this uh, subject. Um, if you look at the India government, uh, Mr. Modi, he has a strong vision, or his uh, government has a strong vision, how to develop smart cities. And they are not talking about millions, they're talking about trillions in investing in this uh, uh, development. How important is smart city for uh, European cities in the mondial, uh, in the global uh, pers perspective. Is it a thing nice to have or is it a thing need to have? I think you would be right in, a, in, a, in the context of a, lo uh, a, a lot of governments don't particularly have smart city. Like if you were to come to Ireland, there's no uh, ministry or minister or there's not even an office for smart cities in any government department it would uh, there's no policy around it for example it's it's at the level of the city so Cork has a smart gateway policy Dublin has a, a, a kind of a smart city policy uh, or strategy but there's no national level Britain has a national level one so uh, which is out of the Department of Business Business and Innovation and um, what they've been doing is funding smart city developments in, in 10 cities in the UK as a way of trying to capture some of the global market for smart cities. So the UK has said we want 20% of the global smart city marketplace. And they're trying to use these cities that they're investing these technologies in as showcases for other. So some cities are about, I think energy, uh, Peterborough is energy and Milton Keynes is transport and Glasgow is security and Bristol is open platforms or whatever it is. So they're, they're using it as an as a economic development strategy to sell consultancy, to sell services, and to sell technology. And one of their prime markets they're selling to, of course, is India. 
You know, so a lot of the Indian cities are being developed by other places. So Singapore is developing three of the cities. Japan is developing five of the cities. The US is developing a number of cities. France is developing a number of cities. The UK is, and so on. The case of India is interesting because they're, they're using the label of smart city where really what it's about is urban development. So, so this is a, this is a, um, it's a kind of a, a national development program about trying to um, uh, up, up, upgrade their cities, you know, so um, and I think it's partly linked into they've looked at places like China, which has had rapid urbanization, brand new modern cities, and India has kind of been left behind, and they're on that agenda. And it's quite interesting in, in India, if you're, if, you're, um, if you're against smart cities, you're against the nation. It's a, it's a national project. It's, a, it's, a, it's that kind of program of rapid development, rapid urbanization to deal with you know, an emerging middle class, a growing economy, and so on. So I think different places. And in the US, I, I was in the US recently, and I was talking to cities there, and they don't use the word smart cities at all. They're, they're kind of, they, don't, they don't like the phrase. They associate it too much with IBM and the corporate sector. And they, and they, they, don't really call, they wouldn't really label themselves as, as smart cities. In Europe, people, cities would label themselves as smart cities, partly to get the EU money that's coming out of smart city programs. You know? And, and you can talk to people in certain sectors, and they, they would say, so I've interviewed a lot of people, and they would say, well, I'm doing transport, I'm doing energy, I'm doing education, I'm doing... Now, they might be using smart city tech, but they don't think of themselves as doing smart cities. They think of themselves as doing energy, or they're doing transport, or they're doing something else. So in a, in a way, it's a kind of a label that is performing diverse work in different places. Yeah, yeah I fully agree with the, the way that the label works in different ways, and there's also a couple of... Yeah, assumptions in, in the way you, you put your question. One thing is that national policy, as in, in India, would actually result in the desired effects in terms of urban innovation. And I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced of that at all. I've done some research on, for example, subsidies to Philips to develop new technologies. And what we, what we could actually show is that they use these subsidies to work on technologies they re did not really believe in themselves, but well, might stand a chance. Whereas the things that they really believe in, they worked on them together. And what we, what we know from the literature on urban innovation is that triple helix collaborations, for example, between Technological University of Eindhoven, Philips, and, and the city of Eindhoven, tend to be very successful. So, so one thing is whether, whether we need national policy to, to make this work. I, I would say national policy should be much more focused on, uh, well, as, as platform 030, which is a platform for exchanging information and knowledge between cities, I find that a very, very sensitive way of, of doing, doing things. And the other thing is, is there a global market? I, I think also, well, for example, Philips really thinks there's a global market in terms of smart lighting. And they're, they're making, they, they really want to use Eindhoven as a showcase to sell their technology around the world. So they would probably not call it smart city technology, they would call it smart lighting, but, but they are really working on it and, and, and that, that's something that they, their ambition is. So I'm not sure if the smart city concept as such is maybe it's too too hollow or too broad, but within it, I'm sure there there can be specific technological niches that can be of advantage to to Dutch firms. But they're also changing their model as to how they're operating as businesses. So if you talk to Philips or GE, they would say that by selling things like LED lights, they're actually reducing their take home. That they that they're giving you a light bulb that will last longer, that costs cheaper. So what what do they replace it with? They replace it with services. So smart lighting is about is about a service layer on top. And that's their sustainable bit, like uh, like um, um, uh, like repairing the lights and um, you know servicing the lights and uh, 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 taking the data and, and producing the data and feeding the data back to the city and so on. So they're 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 trying to see an alternative model about how they can sell services in in when their existing what they're selling ex uh, existingly is is reducing right. Or well, my question relates to your question and your answer, basically saying that the European subsidized uh, subsidies are motivating, stimulating European cities to uh, do smart city implementation projects. I'm no, I, I, it's stimulating them to call them smart city initiatives. <laughs> They're doing the tech regardless. They're going, they, they, they'll, they'll, so Dublin is like looking at smart lighting because it wants to reduce its smart lighting bill by 60%. 
Yes. If it changes all the light bulbs, it will reduce to LED lighting. They'll reduce their energy bill by 65%. If they, if they call it smart city, then they might also get a subsidy from the EU, from the EU to help them do it. Exactly. Um, it's a different, I'm, you know, it's a different okay, thing. They're yeah. going to do it regardless, though. It's not driving the technology like it's... Another question. So, my, I have two questions. Uh, I'm doing research on both, of, uh, on two European uh, smart city projects. One mm -hmm. in Amsterdam, which is finished, Transform. One in Eindhoven, Triangulum, which is ongoing. And in, El in Amsterdam, after two and a half years, uh, like about 15 projects have started. Well, not, well, it, they, the, the uh, smart city projects got stuck in the IG, ID phase. The rollout phase is actually very difficult to achieve and this relates to your second presentation where it's about governance, uh, where it's, it's not the right collaboration um, and they don't know who's accountable, uh, no one's in the lead, uh, there's not the right business model. But, uh, and I'm curious to see what your opinion is on the barriers of these governance factors related to these smart city projects. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, actually, in my research, I'm, I'm finding exactly the same. What we're seeing is that cities are becoming more and more willing to experiment with, with new uh, technologies and new ways of collaboration. But when the experiment ends, basically, the, the, the practice ends. So uh, embedding it in, in, um, in governance practices is, is, is very complicated. Um, I think it's also because there, there's very much a focus on sort of the... Uh, the radical innovation uh, type, so it's really about a very different way of, of doing things, um, whereas in the end, the radical innovation has to be embedded in routines, work processes, uh, normal normal practice, standard operating procedures. And I think what, what cities need to do, and I think this sense is, is growing, is to, to, to uh, bring in the normal practice much at a much earlier stage in the experiment and realize that the experiment works because it's with people that are very, very willing, extra resources, very good conditions, and you cannot just transplant that to, it's the same way like when you, when you grow a plant inside under very favorable conditions and you just put it outside like that uh, in very harsh conditions, then the plant won't survive. So you have to take different intermediate steps to make it work in, in, this, in these harsh conditions. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an understanding that's developing now, but it makes it complicated because yeah, you have to design a, a whole process and not just one experiment. Um, so the innovation strategy needs to be developed further. Um, and now there's much more focus on the demonstrative character of the experiment, showing that it works, but that's not enough. I was, but could I just, uh, because of time reasons also, because, because there's, there's a question on my mind that I want to pose. Because, because you're very much talking about getting datafication back into the public domain, yes? That, that's in, in a certain sense about the reframing. Uh, and that's a very nice idea, uh, to be, make it visible, to make it accountable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, should we talk about ownership of data? We haven't, we haven't talked about that. Yeah, there's a big issue around, um, so this also com partly comes out of your neoliberal issue and around privatization and marketization of yeah. services. When that happens, you often privatize the data. So actually Britain did have a minister for smart cities and I saw him give a talk where he said, we don't have a lot of data for, for London because we've privatized our schools, we've privatized our buses, we've privatized our trains, we've privatized our health service, we've privatized X, Y, and Z, we've privatized our lights, we've privatized, and actually we don't have the data anymore. The data is now private. They own the data and if we want it, we have to buy it back. You know, so at the same time that they're driving an open data initiative, they're also driving a privatization initiative. So, you know, you have to be very careful and we've been trying to, um, working with Dublin to try and get within their procurement that they, so Dublin learned a lesson early on when it accidentally privatised its bike share data. Yeah. They, they, they hadn't written it into the procurement contract and when they asked the bike share scheme for the data, the company just said, no, we're not giving it to you. So the only, the only reason they have the data now is because on the second phase of the rollout, it was written in that they would get the data going forward from when the, when the scheme was expanded. So there is a real issue around access to some of this data. Most of those lists that I gave were all private entities, utility companies, uh, mobile phone companies, app companies, energy companies. The, the, you know, a lot of the data now about cities is not, you know, there's still a lot of government data that can be opened out and shared and so on. But I think if we're procuring the services, 
then part of the procurement process should be getting access to the data that would enable us to kind of know and manage the city uh, uh, better off the back of that. So I think there is an I think there is an issue around looking at those things. Yeah, I, I very much agree there. I, I think it's a, it's an important issue and we should look at it. But I think we also need to understand why it's so complicated. And um, Shoshana Zuboff, uh, an American mm -hmm. um, um, sociologist, came up with the notion of surveillance capitalism. And her point basically is that collection of data by Google, by Facebook, by, uh, by Philips, is not sort of a side product that they can or cannot do, but it's the, at the heart of what they do. So if we do not want them to collect the data, it's the same like say, telling Ford that they should not use the uh, conveyor belt to, to produce cars. It's what they do and it's their business model, why they can be successful. So um, yes, we, we need this regulation, we need to mm -hmm. think of these types of things, but we also need to understand the nature of the new type of capitalism that's, that's uh, unfolding right now, which is surveillance capitalism. And I think our understanding of what surveillance capitalism is and what it means uh, needs, to, yeah, needs to improve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Data is becoming part of a market. And, yeah. then, and if, if we need data to, in a certain sense, address public issues, you know, it becomes an issue. Who's the owner of these data? We are past the clock of five. We're now in drinking time. <laughs> and you're taking this off from your drinking time. So uh, I don't mind. I could go on, but is, is there... Can I just go back to the point about barriers? All right, just for one second. Yeah, for one second, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so I think one of the really big issues is finance, and cities have a real big problem with finance. Well, most cities are broke, yeah. you know, they don't have the... So, you know, if Dublin is going to replace, in Dublin City Council, so one of the four local authorities has 50,000 lampposts, if it's going to replace all of those, and turn them into smart lampposts, and whatever, that's a big upfront capital cost that it doesn't have. So. There's issues there as to how you finance those projects. So that's what often why these kind of experimental projects fail through. At the same time, I would say, though, that there are an awful lot of actually rolled out, actually existing smart city tech. So within, within Dublin, we've documented 40 fully rolled out operational systems. These are not experimental systems. They're not pilot projects. These are technologies that the four local authorities are using, and they're different tech. They're not, I'm not counted one tech four times as in four local authorities. So, so a lot of tech is already here. Intelligent transports are already, uh, transport systems are already here, right? T you know, um, tapping in and tapping out and getting on and smart cards to get in and out of buildings are already here. Building management systems are already here. A lot of the things I was listing are already existing technologies. You know, okay. at the same time, I do agree that a lot of stuff fails. Let's, let's, let's move this to, to the the hall outside and, and continue talking during drinks. Uh, I would like to thank both of you, Rob and Albert, for being here and yes.